Hello, true crime junkies. Raul Esparza is an actor of stage and screen. Tony nominated numerous times, and as far as the screen is concerned, one of his most recent roles is in the excellent limited series on Hulu. It's called Candy, and it's out now. Raul, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm really great. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So this is a dark series, to say the least, but your character provides quite a bit of comic relief. Is that what drew you to this part, and is there anything else that really intrigued you about this role? Uh, what I would say what drew me to Don was uh, partly his bravado and also his um, extraordinary ability to do something that he had never done before in his life. He just believed in this case and believed in Candy and believed in um, the defense that he created for her and went with it 100% with absolutely no experience behind him about how to deal with a trial. And I love that, that kind of, I loved that deep dive that, that he took. For me, part of the fun of playing him too was um what you just uh, uh sort of sort of hinted at is that he's he's very funny but he's deadly serious and the comedy is almost unintentional he's just loving every aspect of the publicity that's coming their way and loving all of the nooks and crannies of things he can explore to try to um save uh, his friend's life and i enjoyed that so even though this is a real story that this series is based on, and I'm somebody who actually grew up in the DFW area, I was only two at the time, so I did not realize it was a real story until, until I started to look a little bit more into the series itself. Uh, for you as somebody who is obviously uh, does his homework with regards to a role, and you're based on a real-life character, how much reading into the past did you do with regards to making sure to get Don right? I did two things actually. One was I want I listened to him a lot. It, it's interesting. There's not that many audio recordings of him and video. I, I so I watched him and I listened to him. There was a particular way that he spoke that I wanted to try to emulate, and that was uh, a real key to playing him because it changed the way I spoke. It, it changed my energy. My energy is a lot faster than his. Um, also, the way he looked i freed myself from any responsibility to try to look like him because this is though it is based on true events we weren't trying to create a documentary here we were doing something that is a fictionalized version of the events because nobody can really know exactly what happened so that kind of freed me from trying to be slavish to who he was exactly though i did you know he was a, a very athletic and he worked out all the time so i thought it was important to have that kind of coiled muscular uh ener energy about him and play with that and uh and then also to kind of dig into the fact that he had a undiagnosed bipolar disorder so part of the fun of him and for me was that you could do one thing with the character in one sentence and do something entirely different in the next sentence and it didn't matter that was just how he saw the world so that was really rich all those things come from Don, except except the mustache. That was not Don. Um, <laughs> and they let me kind of choose the colors I could paint with, and then you just sort of run from there. Well, I thought that the mustache actually played into that, like living by the seat of his pants sort of lifestyle that I think you ended up nailing in the end. Oh, thank you. And yes, I agree. That was, in, Robin and I talked about it. We're like, you know what? It's not historically accurate, but it feels right. You know, and I would look at myself and be like, whoa, who is that guy? And you want that with a character. You want him to surprise you. Why play a version of something you've already done? You want to be played by the character. Uh, you want that that face in the mirror to be like, that's not me. And uh, I don't know. I kind of felt like a badass for a while. <laughs> Maybe the 70s are coming back in a way that, <laughs> that we can all. <laughs> that Texas 70s mustache was so specific. <laughs> well, we're uh, we're definitely getting a taste of the early 80s with regards to uh, the, the crazy inflation of uh, all sorts of prices. So perhaps we get that 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 peculiar style to go along with it, too. <laughs> Actually, I've seen a lot of guys with mustaches running around New York City lately. So maybe that's that's the thing. But uh, there I didn't know this case myself. I grew up I was born in 70 and I, I grew up. Uh, uh, in, in the 80s is like, you know, the, the years that really began to form you. And uh, there were elements of what we had on stage on 
in, in the set that I'd be like, oh, damn, I wore this. Or I was a little <laughs> kid. My life. Or the carpeting in a particular house. I'm like, my mom had this carpeting, you know? <laughs> The wagon that Candy drives around, we definitely had one of those wagons for a while. It's such a bizarre design where the very back seats are facing out the back window. Highly unsafe, and they eventually realized as much, but it's just one of those novelties that you can't help but to enjoy in the moment. Yeah, and you sort of, so I, uh, you sort of love living in that world, but you're right. There are aspects, unfortunately, that I've been thinking about a lot lately when you see those gas prices at the pumps. <laughs> I remember all those long lines of, you know, all the adults having to go sit there and wait for gas uh, yes. at exactly the time that this is talking about. I think there's a lot of things we can relate to in the story because so much of this particular story is about people who feel trapped. This is the life they chose, but these are the things that they're just in the parameters of this one room, this house, this way of living, and then things go haywire. And I think we've all been feeling a little bit of that uh, in the last two years. I know we have. No doubt about that. New York has obviously been run through the ringer. You're a longtime resident of that great city. Uh, how does New York feel to you right now? Because I know speaking with people a year ago, there was a lot of unease. Does it feel like New York is starting to bounce back like it always does when going through difficult times? New York always bounces back, but New York never comes back as the same city. And that's interesting. I was here during 9-11 mm. and uh, there was a sense then that we would survive anything that got thrown at us. But one of the best things about not the best things. One of the greatest things about New York is that New Yorkers gather to deal with crisis. We get together. We couldn't do that in the pandemic. And so what happened in the last two years is that the city felt quite broken and sort of empty. And I know that it will come back because I think this is the capital of the world. The city is bigger than just uh, one place in America. Everybody pours their imagination into what this city is. Everybody pours their ambitions into what this city is. And whether it's a good or or bad, uh, the city, I think, represents a lot of human striving. So some version of it always comes back. That broken feeling is better. It's better. Things are a little more open, but you still see empty storefronts. There's a lot more violence. than, And that reminds me more of what it was like here in the late 80s. And, and that had changed. I hope that that gets healed. But I think there's a lot of anger, too. You're really aware of the haves and the have-nots more than, than I was before. Um, I think it will heal, but who knows what the other side of it is. Um, I definitely don't carry that sense of wounded city with me these days. I'm finding myself smiling a lot more and I'm finding myself looking at that skyline and being like, wow, that's home. Um, I just, I love it here. I, I drank the Kool-Aid where the city's concerned. It's got that energy about it where if you're not used to it, you almost feel like you need another vacation after you spend three or four days there. But once you get acclimated to it, it uh, you just fit right in, huh? Of course you do, because I think that cities are made, you know, though it is a gigantic city, you live in your neighborhood. And your neighborhood is the guy at the bodega, the gym you go to, the restaurants you eat at, the friends you meet up with. You know, in a city full of thousands of restaurants, you can really only think of 10. Then <laughs> you always go to the same places. This is what it, uh, how, how we define uh, our experiences of anywhere we live. I grew up in Miami, but my Miami is very different from what a tourist might see of that city. Hmm. And, uh, I have very specific memories to that. It's the same with this. Yeah, I completely agreed. I lived in Chicago for about seven years before moving back to Austin. And even here in Texas, you don't totally understand the neighborhood thing until you live in a city of that size where it's all these little villages within a metropolis. And that's not to say crap paths don't cross in, in other neighborhoods, but you do get you do get those little comfort zones even amidst the chaos. Yeah, you do. You do. Man, Austin, what a great city. I lived in Chicago myself for eight years. Where'd you live? Uh, kind of all over the place. Armitage and Sheffield, Ravenswood, uh, Old Town. <laughs> I loved it. It was such a great place to live because uh, particularly starting out as a young actor, I could have a, a nice life and not have to make too much money and get to work all the time. And that was really lucky in a way that maybe I wouldn't have been able to do in, in L.A. or New York back then. Um, I My experiences of Texas, actually, the first time I visited were friends, friends in Austin, a wedding that I went to when I was in college. And the I'm Cuban. The experience of the Texas family that I had that trip, I was like, oh, we're exactly the same. The Texans and the Cubans have food is love, giant banquets, giant families, everybody's getting together. And just the embrace of that was so rich for me because I had really only ever been outside of Miami here up north. And up north is very different from what it feels like in the south. 
I really related. Uh, Texas is a place that, uh, that uh, I don't know, it just really touched me. Sh- Particularly that, from Austin to San Antonio, that whole hill country, it's just wow. Chicago ha- kind of has that transformative quality as well. Like I definitely found that when I lived in the Windy City. And considering how long you lived there for and you got your acting start there, did you get to perform at the Steppenwolf? I did, actually. I, I did an adaptation of Slaughterhouse-Five at Steppenwolf hmm. with Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, that, that was, uh, I would say, probably my big break because I was um, in my mid-20s and uh, I played Paul Lazaro, and, uh, which was one hell of a part. And I had wanted to work with Steppenwolf from the minute I, I moved there. I'd been there about three years. And this uh, job came up. I think I learned more about acting from the company of Steppenwolf than I did from any class I ever took. Huh. Or, else i ever worked with they have a philosophy which is throw it at the wall and see if it sticks if it doesn't you can try it again tomorrow and no matter what happens everybody else on stage will catch you and man do they i i something broke in me something really good something changed i became braver than i'd ever been um i think they're among the greatest theater companies in the world so it was a real dream come true i got my equity card at the goodman and i got to work in a lot of the theaters around town but that slaughterhouse experience is what opened the doors to New York, too, um, for me. It just changed everything, getting ah. to work with them. Well, yeah. thank, thank you so much for sharing that. All right, last question, Raul. Uh, I think we could have a 30-minute conversation if we wanted to. But uh, oh. to get things back to Candy, uh, last question here. Obviously, this is an interpretation of events that happened. My question for you is how premeditated do you think what Candy did was? For me? Yeah. As dumb? Mm-hmm. Not at all. How about Maybe. you as how about you as Raul? Not at all. Hmm. I think I mean that. Okay. I mean that today. It's <laughs> such a rich way of telling the story because you're not sure exactly who's telling the truth and what they um what they believed in the moment, but I really found myself at first going, This is insane. I absolutely don't agree with the outcome of this. And then the more I got into to it, the more I was like, you know what? I 100% agree with the outcome of this. So, <laughs> and it depends what side each of the actors would come from. We would get into arguments about it. It's like, no way, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> that's how I feel right now. How what, I feel right now is I take Don's side. I really do. Well, even Pablo's character, like, I feel like if there is a most guilty element of all of this, it's how much he was sweating trying to get a hold of his wife, but. He was also kind of a paranoid dude. He knew that she was on edge. And so you can kind of even justify why he was maybe acting the way he was that night, too. It's true. It's true. Everybody had their had their complete reasonable motives that if you take a step back, you could think, boy, that's troubling. Um, but in the moment, it seems completely valid. And so you can switch sides very quickly. I think it's one of the best things about the series is that it walks that line. It also walks a really great line between being really funny and really horrifying. Um, in strange ways, you kind of go, whoa, I shouldn't find this funny. It's actually sickening. And that's a fascinating way of looking at the ways that people live and the ways we break, which is what the series is also about. It's like day to day life that just smashes. We're this far from the rules keeping us from committing a psychopathic murder. <laughs> 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 so so well put it's uh, such a well acted series and that includes uh, Raul Esparza as the lawyer character appears for the first time apparently in episode 2 but it really intensifies for him episodes 4 and 5 make sure to check it out on Hulu now Raul thank you so much for the time today and thank you for this wonderful performance thank you thanks for having me I'm glad you enjoyed it <laughs>